So this course is all about polygon modeling. Every polygon starts with a point or vertex. Two vertices make an edge. And to make a polygon, the minimum amount of edges we need is three. And this makes a triangle. And now you can see we have a polygon face. We have two other types of polygon that we can work with. The next one is the four-sided polygon or the quad. And then we have the engon, which is a polygon with more than four sides. Now, the polygon that we're interested in in this course is the quad. In fact, most of this course is focused on resolving and maintaining a quad workflow as much as humanly possible. So why are we so interested in the quad? Well, firstly, it's very efficient and it calculates very fast. It also works very well under subdivision and also deformation. But the main reason that we want to go with the quad is that it has one very desirable characteristic. And that characteristic is that it has 100% predictable directional flow. And that's what this first video is all about. So here's how this works. In quad polygons, directional flow or edge flow is driven by opposite edges. That means that anything I throw into this edge here is going to leave this polygon via the opposite edge. Now, when I say throw anything into this edge here, what do I mean by that? Well, this could be the ring selection tool could be the loop selection tool in polygon mode, could be a knife cut in loop mode. The bottom line is that as I start to connect more quads to this, I can accurately predict where these kind of selections or loop cuts are going to end up as they move through the mesh. Now, it doesn't matter how much I distort this polygon, the same opposite edge principle is still going to apply. And that means that I can make any shape I want out of quads and still be 100% sure how these selections and cuts are going to move through this shape. And once you start dealing in complicated meshes, this is a big plus. Now, the quad isn't the only type of polygon, but these other polygon types like the triangle and engon have an extremely unpredictable nature to them. Now, the reason for this is that if I select this bottom edge here, that any selection or cut traveling into this edge essentially has no opposite edge to go to. It essentially has a choice of two edges. Now, not having a definitive opposite edge leads to cinema making a random decision for you. So if I put the knife tool up to this edge, you can see that it's selected the right-hand side. Now, this isn't cinema's fault. This would happen in any 3D application. This is just down to the unpredictable directional flow of the triangle polygon. And indeed, any edge that I touch, I never quite know where it's going to end up. So what if I wanted to go to the left-hand edge? Well, that means I would have to cut through this manually. Now, that's not a big deal with one triangle polygon, but if this triangle is in amongst 2,000 polygons and you want to cut in a particular direction, obviously, you can see this might be a bit of a pain as your edge selection or knife cut is going to veer off in a random direction. Now, we have a similar problem with the engon, but this time we have too many opposite edges. We essentially skip these two, and then Cinema has a choice between this edge or this edge. And if I cut into this bottom edge, you can see it's veered off to the top left. So again, this is problematic when it comes to predictable edge flow. Now you'll notice we have this purple line here, and this is called an engon line, which is kind of a virtual edge. Now this is here because Cinema is trying to interpret this kind of complex polygon by building it out of a triangle and a quad. And this engon line separates these two basic polygon shapes. Now the problem in this engon isn't the virtual quad, because if I cut from here, you can see that 
the uh, knife cut goes to the opposite edge of the quad shape. And if I cut from here, you can see the knife going through the end gone line, which it's thinking of as a virtual opposite edge. The random directional choice is actually dictated by this triangulated shape here. And that's what's causing these random outcomes. So when it comes to trying to maintain predictable edge flow in a mesh, we need to stay away from n-gons and triangles. So let's move this to a simple mesh scenario. If I want to target this red polygon with a ring selection of edges, it doesn't take much to figure out that I have to select this edge with my ring selection tool because it will select this edge and then move to the next opposite edge and so on until it hits the polygon. And we can try that and that's a bit of a no-brainer. So this same edge selection or ring selection here is what would drive my knife tool in loop mode. And you can see it's following those opposite edges. Now this kind of ring selection would also drive a polygon loop selection because essentially the selection would come into here, move to the opposite edge and then say select the polygon attached to this edge and then we move to the opposite edge and select the next polygon along and so forth. And this is entirely predictable, it's never going to shoot off in a random direction and if I do my selection tool in polygon mode, you can see the obvious outcome. So let's try the same thing on this mesh, but now I've added a bunch of triangles and n-gons into it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and cut through this red polygon. So the obvious edge to start with would be this one here. But if I cut into this here, you can see that the first triangle it hits has caused this knife cut to shoot off in a random direction. And if I just select some more edges, okay, you can see we've cut through the red polygon, but it's come at it from a completely different direction via a very random flow. And as we move around the mesh, you can see the kind of unpredictable results we get. The same thing would apply to our loop selection tool. All we get is a bunch of random selections and we have no control over this mesh at all obviously ring selections too now this is the kind of mesh that's going to keep you up at night as it's just a complete nightmare and totally unworkable now so far we've only looked at ring selections in edge mode which are obviously these opposite edge selections but we also have another type of edge selection which is a continuous edge and if I select this edge here and double click, you can see that I get a continuous selection of edges. Now this is being driven essentially by the same thing that drives direction in quads, and that is the number four. So essentially an edge will move through any vertex that has four edges attached to it. So really what it's doing, it's coming up to this vertex here, and it's saying skip these edges here and move to the opposite edge. Again here we have these two unopposite edges so we move to the opposite edge on the vertex. And indeed I can make a continuous selection through any of these junctions that have four edges attached. The thing that disrupts this kind of selection or edge flow is basically the same thing that causes random direction in quads and that is anything that isn't four-sided. So you can see I've rejigged this mesh a little bit, and what I've essentially done is introduce some poles into the equation. Now, poles are vertexes that have more, in this case, five, or less than four, in this case, three edges attached to them. So you could think of this as a triangle, and you could think of this as an n-gon, but with edges. Now, instead of the continuous selection veering off in a random direction, when it hits a pole, it will just simply terminate. So if I double click this edge, it gets to the pole and it just stops. The same would apply to an edge that meets a three-sided pole. 
Now, this means that if you have a mesh with lots of poles in, you want to select a particular edge, you have to kind of double click and then try and continue the selection by shift double clicking the edge to continue it through. Now, there is a way that you can force continuous edges through poles. If I select this edge here, and then I hold Command and Shift on a Mac, Control Shift on a PC, and click this edge here, it will continue the selection to this edge, forcing it through this pole. Now, it's doing this because essentially Command Shift actually just is trying to find the shortest point from A to B. And to demonstrate that, if I click this edge and Command Shift this edge, you can see that it's just trying to get to its destination as fast as possible. But it is a good way of getting out of situations where you have poles and you want a continuous selection along, and it's very useful indeed. Now you'll notice here that this edge, if I double click it, it's not going anywhere, and this is because it's stuck between two poles. Generally, poles are something you just have to kind of live with, and on flat surfaces, they are pretty much no harm at all. They're more annoying more than anything. But if you deform these polygons with a bend deformer and then try and subdivide that surface, you will get lumps and bumps on poles. Now, these are only five-sided poles, and poles can get a lot larger than this. They're called complex poles and should generally be avoided. Now, the only other thing we have to be aware of is the flow in edges that reside on the outside of a mesh, as they have slightly different rules. So if I double click on this edge here, you can see that it goes up this edge here and then terminates at the top. Now, this is because outside edges maintain continuous flow through any vertex that has three edges attached to it. So it's saying I'm on an outside edge there should be a non-opposite edge over here somewhere. And if I put this in symmetry, you could see that this could be the phantom edge I'm talking about. But it's saying, seeing as there's no geometry there, I can just skip one edge here and then keep going. And we obviously have this three-sided vertex here and a three-sided vertex here. Now, it's terminating at the top because the vertex on this corner or this point here here only has two edges attached to it. So if we wanted to continue this selection around this corner, we would have to cut an edge into it. And now if I select this bottom edge and double click, you can see that this edge now travels round. Now just a quick tip, if you have an edge attached to a corner that has no supporting geometry on it and you dissolve it, you will effectively dissolve the point that is hanging in midair. Uh, so you need to melt that instead. Now, the thing that's going to terminate edge flow up this edge is going to be an edge base pole. So if I cut a triangle onto this edge, you can now see that we have four edges attached to this vertice, and that is going to terminate the flow. Again, if we look at these kind of phantom edges, you can see we have this kind of pole shape here. So you want to avoid putting triangles on an outside edge if you want continuous flow around that edge. Now, ultimately, all this adds up to our edge flow complementing the shape that we're trying to make and make our shape as easy as possible to work with. I have this car bonnet here, and you can see it's a very simple mesh, but these 12 polygons are doing a pretty good job of outlining this shape. Now we obviously have lots of different curves running down this shape, and we obviously have this moving and curving down in this direction here, and this directional shift is complemented by these edges here, which are allowing us to bend this shape round. So you could say that the main flow of this shape is moving down this way. It also makes it very easy for us to cut in this detail along here. And overall, this edge flow is working very well for us. This kind of edge flow also makes it very easy for us to subdivide and sharpen this shape while adding some more detail in. And if we look at the finished kind of smoothed result, you can see 
we're getting a very nice outcome. Now, this is an example of exactly what you wouldn't do. Here we have a kind of flow running against the grain of the shape that we're trying to build. And we also have a ton of n-gons, which makes it impossible for us to control cut. I know this is a very ridiculous example, but I think it highlights a point. And together, everything we have here is working against us. We obviously have lots of lumps and bumps caused by our n-gons, where what we want is something more like this. And this is just down to the directional flow complementing the shape that we're trying to make and making our life easier. And this is the sort of concept we will be going for throughout this course. So that's the basics of how direction moves through polygons and edges. In the next video, we will look at how we can redirect this flow to suit our needs.